Hi, good evening, everyone. Hello. I think I'm live. Hi. Okay. Good evening. I hope everyone can hear me all right. Well, I, I, I don't need, I don't hear anything, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. Well, welcome, welcome to um, Lee's live session. I don't know how, what session, this is number five. Yes, it is number five. Okay, so um, before, before I begin, I just want to answer a question because people have been asking me about uh, where, where your sources are, right? So um, I, I want to tell you that I use publicly available information and mostly media reports uh, from both the Chinese, from the Chinese side and also from the, from the English, world, English speaking world. Um, I, I'm very careful not to use any, um, how to say, insider information. Uh, if it's a media report and if it's uh, a credible media, I, I usually tell you where, where, where is it from? Uh, because what, what I'm really doing is, uh, there are so many stories out there. There's so many reports out there. People have already done their work. They're like pearls um, scattered all, all over the places and people may, may not see them. And even if they do see them, they say, yeah, it's a pearl. And then they forget about it. What I do is I gather them, I find them, I gather them, and then I organize them or yeah, organize them and then string them into a bracelet or a necklace. So you find it interesting or beautiful or, or meaningful, but I am not the one who come up with the pearls. I only found them, and um, but most most of my work is finding these pearls and then pick the ones that I think are relevant or will look good together. So that's essentially what I do. I think I don't know if it's a good analogy or not, but I'm not the one who actually create the pearls. Okay, all right. So so I think what I offer is insight and analysis. Okay, so that's just a little a little background on my sources. And for this session, there are so many sources. Uh, I will copy and paste them into the uh, video description at the end of the program. So those of you who want to see where, uh, where, the, where the original sources are, you can find them. Uh, they, they will be separated by Chinese and English. I'll do that after this live. So today's program, oh, hi. All right, so we have people from St. Louis, Singapore. Excellent. Quebec, okay. California, excellent. Mel Melbourne, Aspen, all right. Excellent. Okay. Nigeria, wow, Michigan. Hong Kong, Kentucky, Delaware, Taiwan. Okay, good. Mexico, Ontario, Vancouver, Montreal. Okay, great. Well, welcome. Thank you for, for taking your time off from your Saturday evening and, and spend time with me. I really appreciate that. Oh, you love my flower arrangement. Yeah, the one in the back is, is, is real. You can only see half of it. Uh, it was from an event. There were some leftover flowers and I picked them and then randomly arranged them. So they're a little sad right now, but they're real. Washington State, okay. New York, yeah. Texas, Las Vegas. Cambridge, UK, wow, that must be early in the morning. Bangkok, Tokyo, excellent. Well, welcome. I really, really appreciate um, you guys spending the time with me. And also, uh, last live, uh, people said that I got a little distracted from... Um, from all the super chats, the the super stickers, because uh, every time I got a donation, I I uh, recognize the the donor, the fan, and then uh, people say you got distracted by money, and I say I'm the probably the last person who will be distracted by money, but it's just I just want to show my appreciation uh, to my donors, so I want to just take you know take the time to acknowledge them. That's all, but you could probably tell I'm not a multitasking person. So, all right, Los Angeles, Philippines. Okay, good. 
All right, so today, so we'll, 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 we'll talk about, we have a lot of content today. I don't even know if I'll be able to finish everything in one live. If not, we'll do it uh, a second session. So we'll talk about uh, where we are right now with, uh, with Taiwan after Pelosi's visit. And then uh, most importantly, I want to talk about where Xi Jinping did before he disappeared for the Beidaihe summer gathering, right, for the Beidaihe meeting, because he has disappeared since what, August 1st. So people assume that they're at the Beidaihe for, for the summer retreat or for the summer meeting. So we'll talk about one important event or one important thing he did before, before they left. And then we'll talk about CCP's magic weapon in winning. Uh, it's not what I call their magic weapon. It's what they call their magic weapon, um, weapons. Three. There were three. There were three of them, and then how uh, how Beijing used one particular magic weapon uh, on Taiwan, and then I will mention some of the recent incidents um, as a as a case study or examples. So that's pretty much the plan for for tonight. Okay, Harvard in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Wow, we do have some a lot of brain powers tonight. <laughs> okay. All right, so CCP basically waited after uh, Pelosi left Taiwan uh, to act up, right? So they didn't do anything until she left and then so on. Uh, and then they started to act up with the, the, um, the, the, the mili military drill uh, by firing mis missiles. I think it's a distraction. Uh, it's just a, a show for its domestic audience and also for the international audience. Uh, but let's take a look at what actually happened before that, leading up to that point. So Beijing was notified of Pelosi's possible visit on July 9th when Tony Blinken uh, met with his counterpart, Foreign Minister Wang Yi, um, at Bali at the uh, G20 meeting. So 10 days later, the Financial Times released Pelosi, Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, and so the whole world know about it. So the question is, who released it? it did the Chinese side leak the information or the, did the US leak the information? I've seen people saying uh, both, um, but I think it doesn't matter. We don't know who leaked it, but whoever leaked it obviously leaked it with the purpose trying to stop Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi from going, but it didn't work. He, she went, right? So, so, so whatever whatever tactic they were trying to pull uh, to stop her from going didn't work, and she went. And so I said, um, starting from August 1st, Xi Jinping and then the top leadership have disappeared from the public eyes. Uh, but before she, before she left, uh, from July 29th to the 30th, uh, Xi Jinping attended a meeting and gave a speech at the meeting, and it is the CCP's central, the CCP Central Committee's United Front Work Conference. I don't know if you're familiar with the CCP's United Front Work uh, Department. It is, um, it is an important organization that directly reports into the CCP's Central uh, Committee or Commission. Um, depends on how you translate it. But it's the organization that's responsible for gathering intelligence on managing relations with and attempting to uh, influence important individuals and organizations outside the CCP and also outside China. It focuses on overseas Chinese or foreign KOLs or key opinion leaders who hold important political, commercial or academic positions. Um, so the organization's goal is to make sure that these individuals and group support Beijing's interests and agenda. Some people call it the CCP's foreign influence operation. I think that's a very accurate description. It's not a spy agency, but it's work. Uh, it's not a spy agency. It's not an intelligence agency, but it's working in a way to gain foreign influence, right? Um, even though it's not a spy agency, the work can be deadly. I'll show you one example later. So it's important strategy. Uh, the United Front work, this, this foreign, foreign influence operation is very important to CCP because Mao Zedong uh, was the one who started, started it. And he used this strategy during the civil war against the nationalists and won. 
And again, Deng Xiaoping revived this strategy during the 1980s and 90s to obtain outside support for its economic reforms and also uh, to support the one, one country, two systems model in Hong Kong. And uh, oh, by the way, the current, uh, it, the, the, the famous Chinese premier, Zhou Enlai, was the first head of the organization way back, way back when. And then the current head of the organization, Yu, Yu Quan, I think it's the, the guy's name is Yu Quan, was sanctioned in January 2021 by the Trump administration. So the meeting Xi Jinping attended is important. Uh, yeah, you may say, well, he, the guy attends so many meetings, right? There's so many CCP meetings. Why would you say, well, attending this meeting is so important? Well, it's important because this type of meeting is not frequently held. The last time high-level United Front Conference was held seven years ago in May 2015. So, uh, and that was Xi Jinping's first time to address the United Front work. And the one before that was nine years ago in 2006. So this type of meeting is not, oh, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, so, so this type of um, meeting is not held frequently. Uh, what Xi Jinping said at 2015 was that he proposed to expand the United Front work uh, by focusing on overseas students, private entrepreneurs, people from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan and religious figures. So that's what he said in 2015. This time, this year, he obviously talked about the challenging geopolitical situations for China, and he gave three directions. First is safeguarding national um, sovereignty, security, and national developed interest. So basically he said any work we do should, uh, is to, to, to safeguard national sovereignty, security, and uh, development interests, and then to serve the, the general interests of the party. And then, interestingly, he said, to strengthen and expanding the party base, right? So that means, uh, the, the way I interpret it is like it's expanding Communist Party membership outside China or outside the CCP or you know, and not within the normal CCP base, right? Because the, the whole the, the whole organization is dedicated to work on people outside the outside CCP and outside China. So by expanding the party's base, I mean you're expanding the party base beyond China's border. So uh, the other reason why this is important is this United from United United from work. It's mouthful to say is Mao's one of the three magic weapons to defeat opponents. It is basically to use money, women, fame, and reputation to buy, to buy our key, key, key people, key leaders on the opposing side to form a secret alliance. Uh, it's to spend the least amount of money or resource to cause the greatest loss for the opponent so they could win. So this is one of the, uh, the three magic weapons. Um, you might wonder what are the two two other magic I mean magic weapons. The other two, the second one is called armed revolution or military attack, and the third one is ideological work through building party organization. And these are and then they don't work alone; they work hand in hand. And these are the three magic weapons for the CCP to win. If you really look at it, that's pretty much what it has been doing, right? Um, so in Taiwan, for example, the military the military attack uh, is the second one, the armed revolution or military attack. And then the first one is the United Front work, basically is infiltration, uh, foreign influence operations. And the last one is ideological work through building party organization. That's expanding the CCP's footprint into your opponent's territory uh, by recruiting party members and, 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 and expanding your party organization. Um, it, it comes from uh, uh, a quote from the Russian communist leader, Vladimir, Vladimir Lenin, who said, to break the enemy, one must start from inside its fortress. So, okay, so that's kind of the intro or the historical background. Now let's talk about Taiwan. Uh, there is a saying, I've, I've noticed that there is a, the CCP has been talking about uh, the expression in Chinese, it's 打台湾不如买台湾. So basically it says, 
buying out Taiwan is better than military attack. And this is not like a secret, uh, a, a secret expression or a secret strategy. It has been publicly uh, announced. It's been talked about a lot. So, and it started more than 10 years ago. So in 2010, uh, Voice of America interviewed uh, a professor from Taiwan, Danjiang University, a professor by the name of Lin Zhongbin from the International Strategic Research Institute. And, and according to Professor Lin, China has already changed its strategy um, uh, on Taiwan as early as 2004, because that year Beijing removed, uh, removed wording such as uh, we will, we do not, we, we reserve the right to use military force uh, to take over Taiwan. Uh, Beijing removed these wording, these texts from its national defense white paper in 2004. And then also this kind of words using military attack uh, start to disappear from Beijing's official language. And then uh, he said that starting 2008, after the Taiwan election, um, which elected Ma Yingjiu as the president, uh, China adopted more softer approach, basically is, which is the softer approach is to buy, use economic influence, use money to buy out Taiwan as opposed to a military attack. But uh, even though it appears softer, its political agenda, its goal is the same. So now let's talk about what it has done. So this April, a Taiwan-based think tank called Double Think Lab published um, a ranking, a list of countries that are most infiltrated by China. And guess who's the first one? Should I, I, I can't do online poll. It would be great if I could do online poll. Does anyone want to guess? Um, Pakistan. Okay. Taiwan, no, it's not Taiwan. It's Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia was the most infiltrated country by China, followed by Singapore and Thailand. Taiwan ranks number nine overall out of the 36 countries, but Taiwan ranked first with regards to media infiltration. So um, there, there are quite a number of report, media reports um, investigative reports on how much China has um, bought out Taiwanese media. Um, you know, I've seen numbers, you know, I mean, there's several ways they do it, you know, by contents, right? Uh, advertisement, that's, that, that's pretty straightforward. But the, the most, the most, uh, in, the most, how to say, what's the word? The most secretive way or non- invasive way, but deadly is um, using local Taiwanese businessmen to buy out these Taiwanese media. And these Taiwanese billionaires all have major businesses in China because the CCP knows that it cannot directly buy Taiwan media. It will be too conspicuous, right? It will cause public uh, outcry. So it has, wished that those Taiwanese, you know, businessmen who have big business in Ch mainland China can buy these, um, these media outlets. So China can indirect, indirectly control these media outlets, outlets by controlling these people. So there's, there are um, a number of uh, reports that, you know, I mean, people from Taiwan know that the, the, the Wang Wang Jituan, the, uh, one of the, one of the, Taiwanese company that own that have big business in China bought you know a number of um, Taiwan newspaper and and TV outlets so it's it's pretty much all under their control um, but I'll I'll send you a, a link the Financial Times thank you Frosty Flake thank you um, Um, so, okay, so one of the, it has been, it has been careful not to, not to, um, how, how do I say, after the CCP 
I used a lot of Taiwanese businessmen to buy all these media outlets. Taiwanese people still notice it. So they're, you know, they're, then they get very, you know, then they get careful. So what happened is they then use foreigners. One of the largest Chinese TV network, Dongsen TV, which is called Eastern Television, was bought by American business, businessman and filmmaker by the name of Dan Mintz in 2015. He spent 600, 600 million US dollars to buy 80% in uh, EBC, EBC, which is um, Eastern uh, Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, this, this Dan Mintz co-founded his entertainment company called Dynamic Marketing Group with Beijing-based, with two Beijing-based Chinese. And the father of one of the two Chinese guy uh, was a top PLA general. So at the time of the deal in 2015, um, a Taiwanese rep uh, reporter quoted Mintz as saying, if Chinese and Chinese companies uh, offered to buy Dongsen or Eastern, the TV network, it's probably not gonna be approved, but I'm not Chinese, so I think it's gonna be okay. So there are a lot of um, concern um, in Taiwan that you know the CCP is using uh, a foreigner, an American, who has who also has close business tie, to buy uh, a Taiwanese media or become the majority owner of a Taiwanese media. Uh, so this you know this kind of practice is is common. And I think the CCP is not just using that in Taiwan. They're using that in other parts of the world as well. So uh, right now, uh, there are about 800 households, you know, I'm sorry, 8 million households in Taiwan. And 5 million uh, have cable TV network. And most of these TV cable, uh, most of the TV network providers are controlled by a few Business conglomerates by 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 these business um, businessmen. So when Apple Daily, uh, you're familiar with Apple Daily, Jimmy Lai, uh, the guy who's in prison because uh, because you know Apple Daily is the one of the most outspoken media in Hong Kong that uh, report polit CCP politics truthfully, and he's um, he was he is sent to prison. So Jimmy Lai has a has a TV network in in Taiwan. And he couldn't get on the cable network. You know, they just don't let him get on the cable network. So he was losing a lot of money. And in that was in 2010. Uh, in 2012, he decided he's going to get out of the Taiwan market because he couldn't, you know, he, he couldn't get advertisement revenue. He, he couldn't get on cable. So he was selling his business. He sold it in 2013. And as soon as he sold the business, the network got on cable. And then, but from that moment on, you know, the TV network changed its editorial direction. It became one of uh, one of the. It becomes similar to other Taiwan network. So, so that's uh, so buying Taiwan. You know, the CCP has a very tight control over Taiwanese media. I have a friend who visited Taiwan recently, and then. She said, you know, when she went to this tiny little place like um, Greasy Spoons in these mom and pop shops in like suburbs of Taipei, and then she go and then in noodle shops, and people are watching these TV networks, and then the the it's mainland Chinese propaganda, and she was just shocked, and these people just watch these TV. The TV was turned on all the time, and people just watch that. Um, so that's that's a very dire situation in Taiwan, I think. Now, outside media, uh, from from 2000, from 2008 to probably 2016, uh, China has invested a lot of money in 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 Taiwan. So I'll just give you some some quotes. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you. So, for example, uh, all the provinces in China rushed to to go to Taiwan. The, the Fujian province, the, 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 the governor, Huang Xiaojing, you know, led a delegation to Taiwan and signed 68 investment projects and invested 900 million US dollars. And Hunan province, 
uh, organized uh, uh, a week-long event in Taiwan, and its uh, deputy governor led a delegation of 300 people, signed business uh, deals worth 1.7 billion US dollars. And then Guangdong province, one of the wealthiest province in China, led a delegation of a thousand pers a thousand people and signed $5.2 billion worth of um, contracts with Taiwan business. So you wonder, so all these businesses now have the CCP's footprint in, in them, right? So what's their status now, right? So, um, and, 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 this is, and this is still ongoing uh, because I think since the uh, Tsai Ing-wen won the presidential election, I think the, the business partnership, the business deal kind of died down a little bit. It, it, it slowed down a little bit. So in order to pr keep promoting this cross-strait economic collaboration in 2018, Beijing announced uh, 31 policies or, or measures to promote cross-strait economic and cultural exchange cooperation. It basically offered Taiwanese business tax benefits and allowed them to participate in state-sponsored infrastructure projects, such as the Made in China 2025 programs. Um, but this, uh, this kind of policy change in mainland China does have an impact on Taiwanese uh, per public perception of of China. So a poll conducted by Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation seven months after China rolled out this 31 policies in 2018, it found that the number of Taiwanese who support unification increased to 26%. And then uh, it went down. And then when the Hong Kong uh, protest uh, broke out against the extradition law in 2019, the percentage of people in Taiwan supporting uh, unification with the mainland went down from 26% to 13%. So these, this kind of mainland, because of the media infiltration, um, anytime mainland China issues some kind of a policy, it does have an impact on uh, the, the mind of the Taiwanese public. And, and then this buying out Taiwan is not just limited to media and business. It also includes ordinary Taiwanese people. So influencing schools, religious organizations, and grassroots, organ, grassroots organizations by offering them fully paid or subsidized trips to China is very common. So I saw a report that more than 100 village chiefs uh, in Chinese, it's called Li Zhang. You know, it's the lowest level of government official in Taiwan. Uh, they run like the, maybe, maybe it's more like township in the US, but maybe it's a village in, um, in Taiwan. More than a hundred of Taiwanese, uh, these village chiefs or, or township mayors have visited China. Some have signed agreements with mainland China and some even serve as executive directors uh, on the village committee or, or, uh, or municipal committees in mainland China. So they have dual responsibilities. Um, Apple Daily, Jimmy Lai's organization, investigated the large scale summer camps uh, that had as many as 1,000 Taiwanese students were held in 18 provinces in China. And CCP leaders came to speak at these summer camps. Uh, and this, this has been going on uh, for quite a while. Uh, until until the pandemic. And the thing is, when asked why the gov Taiwanese government did not stop uh, this kind of exchange program, uh, they cannot because uh, cultural exchange programs do not need to be approved by Taiwanese government. So the, minist the Ministry of Education cannot do anything. It's purely uh, civilian activities. So they cannot stop that. All right. So so that has been kind of what's happening. Buying, buying, buying Taiwan is better than military attack. This program has been run for almost like 10 years until CCP ran out of money. Right? Somewhere around 2018, 2019, you know, CCP you know, has spent so much money. And then before the pandemic, it realized it doesn't have as much money. And then uh, you know, it, has, it has grown. Uh, it has developed so much digital surveillance 
program or technology, and then they come up with a new saying is my Taiwan buru pian Taiwan, which is misinformation is better than buying up Taiwan. Right? So buying up, buying up Taiwan is better than military attack, and now misinformation is better than buying up Taiwan. So using their digital surveillance technology and online propaganda, uh, it's it has a huge Im impact on um, on Taiwanese um, politics. So I'll just give you I'll just give you two examples. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Let me take a sip of water. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let me see. If, do I have any questions? Uh, great video. Do I see? Thank you for your research information. Yeah, it's a good pausing point for me to see. It. Do I have any questions? Frosty Flake. Uh, CCP's foreign exchange position dipped below one trillion. Uh, BlackRock appears to write down over one trillion in CCP debt. Yes, I I noticed that, but I will I will look into that. I cannot comment anything right now because I haven't done my research yet, but I've heard about it. Let's see. Richard W. Hi, Lei. Thank you for the informative show. Oh, thank you, Richard. Let's see. Do I have anything else? I think that's about it, right? Okay, good, good. I'm not missing any questions. Thank, thank you, Diana, Diana. Thank you. All right. So now let's talk about misinformation. Uh, what's the status of home mortgage buyout? Is the economy still strong? Uh, no, it's a big topic. I probably will be making more videos to, to talk about that. Is the Ch is Chinese Communist Party more hardline than the Vietnamese? No, the Chinese Communist Party is more hardline than the Vietnamese. I made a video on that. Um, at least in Vietnam, they allow Google, Facebook, and these uh, apps in Vietnam, but it's they're censored in China, right? So you, you can't have Google, Facebook, Twitter in China, but you can access these social media apps in, in Vietnam. Yeah. Okay, so misinformation. So I'll just give you an example to show you how deadly it can be. Uh, Oh, by the way, um, I saw that there are about 200,000 200, fake accounts uh, that are created in Taiwan that work in concert with these uh, online trolls to generate this kind of impact. So in September 2018, a typhoon called Swallow hit Japan, and uh, Osaka was the worst hit area. And the, the Kansai International Airport, which is the third largest airport, in Japan was paralyzed for 24 hours because the runway was flooded with water and the external cross sea bridge was damaged by, um, by an oil tanker. Uh, a lot of travelers were stranded at the airport um, um, and including Taiwanese travelers and, and you know, Chinese travelers. The CCP's internet trolls produced fake news uh, that claimed that China sent buses to the airport to rescue Chinese tourists uh, and that Taiwanese tourists and any Taiwanese tourists uh, who would announce that they are Chinese could also be rescued, right? And that's, that's not true because uh, China didn't send any buses. All the buses were sent by Japanese government. So China did not send any, that was obviously fake news. Uh, now the Chinese trolls attacked the Taiwanese the Taiwanese diplomat. Uh, his name is Su Su Qichen, who is the uh, the equivalent of consul general in Osaka because uh, Taiwan and Japan do not have diplomatic re relations, so they do not call that a consulate. They call that uh, economic and cultural uh, exchange office. Yeah, um, what do you call that? The TECO, Taiwan Economic and Cultural. Uh, office, something like that. But, she, but he's the equivalent of a consul general in, in Osaka. The Chinese trolls attacked him and accused him of losing to mainland in terms of uh, efficiency and helpfulness in helping uh, Taiwanese. And then, and then the information was not verified by Taiwanese media, but it was widely quoted by Taiwanese media and uh, it was discussed 
on TV program, in newspaper, uh, in various political programs. And the CCP Taiwan Affair Office used the opportunity to reassure Taiwan, to attack uh, the inefficiency of the Taiwan, Taiwanese diplomats and reassure Taiwanese that China, the motherland, has, has your back. So under pressure, uh, under pressure from media, you know, the internet, local Taiwanese people, his superior, and also um, Yeah, and also, you know, people within the, the Taiwanese government, the consul general committed suicide. He's a veteran diplomat who had 27 years of service. And if you really look at it, the tragedy was caused by a, a concerted effort of CCP's online trolls in China. And then the Taiwanese media that are controlled by China, right? Because the Taiwanese media did not verify this information. They pretty much just widely you know propagated the CCP's lies and then the the misinformation got into the 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 Taiwanese officials because it's so overwhelming that just show you the power of media and then so his superior probably did not know what's going on so the, the poor man uh died and and I, and I just want to show you how deadly the fake news can be when it's used in multi-dimensional in a multi-dimensional uh, fashion, and then that was in 2018, and it happened this May. An artist by the name of uh, Guo Yanjun, I think he's a no, he's an entertainer, and he just accidentally posted uh, something and said he was talking with his friend, and he he said a lot of kids died from COVID, and then in, with very quickly that post that. A lot of kids died uh, from COVID. Was widely spread in uh, in Taiwan, and then eleven mainstream media in Taiwan uh, reported this with headline: uh, "Many kids died from COVID." So they started to accuse the Taiwanese government of, um, you know, misinformation, mismanagement, or cover up, or or maybe the COVID was so bad in Taiwan that you guys are just covering up and. And, uh, and this and that. But what happened is um, the content farm, what they find out is within half of a, within half of a second, uh, 11, 20 content farm, 20 Facebook fans uh, posted this, the, this, the same post with modified information. So you have uh, within half of a half, Within half of a half of a second, you have 20 Facebook groups that posted the same information. You know, slightly modified. If they're exactly the same information, then you may say, well, maybe they just, you know, send all the same the same post. No, they're slightly modified, so they're different, but they're saying the same thing. So how can you have 20 Facebook groups that send this slightly different information within half of a second? So they they are you know content farms uh, hosted by China, and then um, and then there are some Taiwanese uh, legislators asking the government to look into that. So you see, um, CCP has really mastered the the, the digital surveillance technique to uh, use a hybrid of online trolls, content farms, and mainstream media to manipulate public information to its advantage. And very sadly, you know, they, they have perfected the, 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 the skills. Okay, let's see. Let's see, I have a question. Thank you for your channel and sharing your knowledge and education. I'm enjoying your content on the history of China and current affairs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sask Hiker. I'm trying to pronounce names correctly. Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right. So I just talk about media and then online. So let, let's not talk about military. Reuters had a very detailed report on this last December. It's called T-Day, the Battle for Taiwan. You can read it. I'll provide you the link. Uh, in one of my earlier videos, I also talked about the infiltration in the Taiwanese military. This has a known 
a known issue by the Taiwan government. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. This has started more than a decade ago. Uh, about the same time, China changed its strategy to buying out uh, from military attack to buying out Taiwan. Uh, so it, what, the, the, the typical way it does is again using money, women, uh, you know, offering these military officers, usually junior ranking officers or retired uh, officers. Offering them gifts and free trips to China,、uh, and then once they befriend them, you know, gradually they will gain their trust.、Uh, and、um, according to the Reuters report, it, this, the, there are three objectives for CCP to do this. The three objectives, other than obtaining military intelligence,、uh, which that's only one of the goals. There are two other goals. The other is to Demoralize Taiwanese troop so that they don't trust each other. So anytime you have these spy cases flaring up, you know it de demoralizes the military. It demoralizes the, the the commandership. It also demoralizes the the government, right?、Uh, it also、uh, destroys the trust that Taiwan government has with its allies. So there has been reports that the United States government does not trust the Taiwanese government. Um, because of the, these、um, these inf you know military infiltration, so that's the that's the、um, that's the second goal. All right, so that's right. So so okay. So other than obtaining military intelligence, the two other goals: one is demoralize the military's.、Um, Ability to fight, and then the other is to destroy the trust the Taiwanese government has with its allies, for example, the United States. All right, so now let's talk about what's what's happening now, right? So people say even though、uh, the military drill that we've seen the past couple of days, no, no, in in not not it only it only happened on one day. Even though CCP has not really attacked Taiwan through military means, it has already attacked Taiwan electronically. Starting from August the second,、uh, Taiwanese government websites and infrastructure website, or even civilian websites, have been attacked on a large scale. And actually, the CCP has never stopped attacking Taiwan、uh, internet, internet or、um, websites. According to Checkpoint Software, it's which is an、um, uh, uh, internet internet security provider. According to their data, in 2021,、uh, Taiwan organizations in Taiwan, on average, received 2,644 attacks per week, and it increased by 38 percent from the year before. And this increase is higher than the world average. So、just to give you、um, a comparison, so on、uh, globally, the average average number of attacks、um, uh, per week is 925, right? In the Asia Pacific, the average weekly attack is 1,353. In Europe, it's 670. In North America, it's 503. So the fact that Taiwan receives 2,644. It's five times more,、uh, five times that of North America, four times that of Europe, twice of the the average of um, of um, Asia Pacific. So it's it's higher. So that's another risk. So what this has caused is something that I notice. Okay, Taiwan's power outage. I don't know if you noticed that recently Taiwan has had some major power outage, and once was in March. No, they were both in March, March third and March eleventh, right back to back within a week of each other. And the one on March third was was so big that it affected 5.5 million household. Taiwan only has 8 million household, so it's what 70 percent of its populations. So it's the entire island,、um, and it's the fifth, and it's the fifth 
it's a large scale electric electricity out, outage during President Tsai's administration. It's the fifth time. And then if you look at the cause, if you look at the causes of all the five um, power outage, they're all man-made factors. You know, something happens, incorrect uh, operation uh, or wrong, you know, if somebody hit the wrong switch. So it's all man-made factor, which really makes me a little suspicious. You know, I think Taiwan, uh, so Taiwan is one of the best educated country. Uh, I just don't can't believe that they have so many man-made incidents in, in a national power grid over and over again. So that makes me wonder. And then the, the, the latest one happened at Taoyuan International Airport. It caused the airport to shut down for five hours because of no power. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> and then after investigation, authorities said that it was caused by two contractors stealing and cutting cables. And one of the contractors is a convict who was on medical parole. So, so the question is, how could airport hire a convict without checking background, right? How did he got the job? And, and also in another um, a public elected official questioned, so why did these two people, I mean, their goal, their claimed goal is to steal electric cables. And they asked the question, there were so many cables on the ground, why they didn't steal the cable on the ground and they, but had to use a, a lift truck to go up in the air to cut the cable, um, and also why did they? Why didn't do this? If it's just to steal cable, why didn't do it at night? And they have to do it like nine o'clock in the morning. So there were a lot of questions. Um, and um, but if you look at really look at the Taiwanese media, I think they're just trying to uh, sweep it under the rug, shall we say, and try to say, oh. The, the Thai administration is accusing the CCP again. Uh, they, they're trying to cover up their, um, they're trying to cover up and by accusing the CCP, right? So they, I just think there's not enough investigative reporting in Taiwan for such major issues that happen over and over again. And then the reason that was given after the investigation is just so incredible. It's, it's, it's not even believable. And so um, I, have a, I have a contact in Taiwan who's in the energy sector. And then he basically said that he, he does not believe that the reason is as claimed. Um, so, but I think I'll just leave it there. I don't want to go any further into that. Maybe we could do a video on that if we want to drill down. Let's see if I have any questions. I've talked a lot. Where and how do you get so much insight into China and their international affairs? Like I said, um, these are all public media, public information. I'll provide the links to you uh, at the end of this uh, live. You can see them. A, a lot of them are in Chinese, their media from Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, and also in the US. And some of them are, are, are English media. They're, 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 they're all over the place. I, I didn't come up with this. Uh, I, I found them. So you could, if you read Chinese, it would be very helpful. If you're doing research into the subject matter, maybe you should have someone you know, translate the Chinese for you. But these reports are very detailed. OK, all right, let's see. Any questions? Anyone know how widespread Taiwanese loyalty to China is? Um, I did a survey about Taiwanese. I think the pandemic has changed a lot of things. I just saw that uh, a Taiwanese businessman who used to be very pro-China uh, donated 100 million US dollar uh, to national defense after the, uh, the recent um, missile, missile uh, drill. So I think what has happened in the past two years and particularly in the past couple of months has changed the mind of Taiwanese people. A lot of people used to support China 
or who used to support unification, I think have changed their mind, which is a good thing. I think Taiwanese people are coming together more and more. Uh, whatever CCP does, it only uh, make the people in the world see see the situation more clearly, right? So. Okay. Um, Read them with Google Translate, sure. Yeah, uh, I've done business in Taiwan and for 25 years, good place to do business. Yes, Taiwan is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a beautiful place. People there are very nice. Do you think part of China's retaliation will involve providing military assistance to Russia? Do you think part of China's retaliation will involve providing military assistance to Russia? That's a very complex question. Um, I need to do th some thinking on that. Uh, I don't have an immediate answer for you. Sorry. Will America back up Taiwan 100% with their military? Will NATO get involved? And will Japan get involved with South Korea? These are the questions that we should ask these countries, right? Basically, uh, the I think Japan is 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 because the, the five of the missiles landed in the economic zone uh, uh, of, Thai, of of Japan. So the Japan foreign ministry uh, basically told CCP, told Beijing to stop the military drill because five of the missile landed in their water. And the reason the, the water, the, the, the missile landed in their water is because Taiwan and Japan are so close and some of the waters could be overlapping. So, so to China, they think that water, if the water belongs to Taiwan, then it has jurisdiction, but you know, so uh, so the CCP said uh, we have not, you know, we have not determined whose water it is yet. It's premature for you to claim that this is your water, um, but but I think it may whatever happened in the last day or so uh, will help Japan to um, you know update its constitution, right? So I mean, it, it only helps to, um, Japan to make up its mind. To um, to update its constitution to to uh, allow it allow the country to have um, uh, a, a a military, not just for defense purpose. Okay. What's your opinion of the two Chinese that took small rubber boats at night to Taiwan last year? Claimed that they were escaping China. I'm suspicious. Um, the reason I'm suspicious is China, the CCP has a saying, Jie chuan chu hai, borrow, you know, it, it's, it's going to cover up, uh, it's going to cover up a civilian boat to, to attack, right? The, the day, the day Nancy Pelosi landed in Taiwan, I think the, one of the CCP website posted a picture that shows like thousands of, uh, fishermen's boats, uh, like, implying this is our way of attack. So I think uh, I'm suspicious of that, especially when it has happened repeatedly. It's not like one isolated case. It has happened quite quite a number of times. So I'm suspicious. Where do you think we'll be a year from today? I don't know, but I think, I think if people around the world, uh, let me ask the previous question. What would the United States um, would do, NATO would do? I think right now, I mean, Nancy Pelosi made the trip. I think the whole, basically there's no, there's no backing down. That we, basically the, the United States has to stand firm, right? To, I mean, some people say, you know, oh, Nancy Pelosi's trip made put Taiwan and Taiwanese people in a more dangerous situation because now look at the CCP. It's, you know, it's going mad. It's threatening. Um, I think her trip didn't really change the CCP. I mean, it's always aggressive. It always wanted to take over Taiwan. It, it you know, you, you can't really say, oh, Nancy Pelosi made them more vicious over Taiwan. She didn't do that. Uh, it just make it more. Uh, it, it just it, it just make it show its true face. It cannot hide anymore. Okay. All right. 
Do I have bad signal? Why am I seeing this thing flashing? Anyways, what's your opinion on the two Chinese? Oh, I already answered that. Uh, okay, so. Hope you could have the have a chat with the likes of Lao Wai 86, Chris Chapel, and Sopenza. That would be great. Sure, yeah. Why now? I just haven't got the time to to reach out. Um some is there something wrong with my with my website? Can you guys hear me? Okay, I'll have to end this now. Thank you. Bye-bye.